Look on one. Up till now, uh, I've probably struck you as a, a completely organized person that had all his ducks in a row. Well, down here in my garage, and uh, you're seeing that it's a real mess. I'm having trouble uh, always, whenever I look for tools to, to find them, often they're right in front of you. Generally, I try to avoid tools. I know some of you people are handy, but not me. I just maim myself with tools. I know what I'm looking for is here somewhere. Here it is. It's a novel that I want to enlist to help me talk to you tonight about uh, tools of the trade uh, for writers. Not just famous writers, not famous novelists and poets. Writers like you and I uh, need these tools too. Um, again, you know, three is that magic number, and they are three in number. I'd like to talk to you tonight about rhetorical distance. I'd like to talk to you about tone. And I'd like to talk to you about attitude. Uh, three very important elements of style that you need to understand for your writing. And maybe I, if I get lucky here with uh, this evening's demonstration, maybe I can give you a pointer or two uh, about uh, controlling these things in your writing lives. And maybe when it comes to writing this critical review, uh, but I'm hoping uh, you'll sit down and craft in the next week or so. Now, um, regarding distance, uh, it, it's kind of an obsession with, with rhetoricians like me. The distance between a voice and a given audience can be controlled in many, many different ways. Um, distance can be near, distance can be, you know, sort of medium, sort of medial, and, and the distance can be far. There's lots of ways uh, that writers control that. One of the ways w uh, is, is with language, right? If you use very formal words, uh, maybe like the ones I showed you a few lessons back in the stuff in a little graduate paper I wrote about a year and a half ago, you're going to hold your audience at a distance. If you use familiar words, colloquial, colloquial words, slang, slang for instance, um, they're going to, that, that will draw an, an audience close to you. I always marvel at the beginning of every class. I walk into the room and, and you know, rhetorically, I'm far from the students. It'll happen in January. Uh, and it'll happen next fall, too, when I start up another year at Central Lakes College. In January, on the 9th of, the, of this uh, year, uh, I'm going to walk into the room, and there's going to be a few students that are coming back to me. I can see that from the rosters. But there's also going to be students that are complete strangers to me. The distance there will be far. By the end of the semester, the distance will be much closer. Uh, they'll find out that I'm harmless, that I mean them only goodwill, and that I just want to help them on their way. Same thing happens in writers. You can push people back and pull them close. Tone is what the famous Walker Gibson describes as the relationship between a voice and a particular audience. You understand this too. We have tones that are represented by the, the emotions that we have. Um, uh, a tone, tone can be angry. A tone can be um, conciliatory. A tone can be friendly. Um, um, I, every year I stand in classrooms and ask young people, and even older students, how many of you like to be sarcastic? Every time I ask that question, the hands go up in the air. And like a man going down into hell with a glass of ice water, I try to talk them out of being sarcastic. I say, why can't you just be ironic? Now, I've got a lot of personal problems, but sarcasm to me is the trope of last resort. I can't remember if we talked about this or not. I think it's destructive, for instance, when, when teachers are sarcastic. I can't stand in a classroom and say, well, thanks, genius. Nice answer. You know, that's sarcasm. There's no room for them to go. Uh, again, it's, it's the trope of, of last resort. In the controlling of tone, you've really got to be careful. You've got to be careful, particularly in your workplaces. Uh, we don't write memorandums anymore, but we write emails. And it is very quickly, very easy to get in trouble with tone. I know you've had this experience, especially with you young students. You pick up a phone and you text a friend, and maybe you intend a certain thing, but you, 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 know, you don't have a lot of room there in, the, in that confined little space of symbols. And in, in a hurry, you, you text and, and you think you're being funny or you think you're being satirical. And, and you can hurt someone's feelings. You've got to watch it. You've got to really be careful uh, with tone. Attitude is the word that Walker Gibson uses to describe the, dist uh, the, the relationship between a given writer, a speaker, and a subject. And we all have subjects uh, about which we can speak positively. We also have subjects about w which we're going to be negative. It's pretty rare that you're very that you you're neutral. Um, 
that you're ambivalent about a topic. It's praise or blame, right? We like things or, or, or we don't like things. Um, let's take a look at um, two demonstrations of these, of these things. And let's go to the literature um, for the examples. I'd like to read you um, just the first paragraph from Ernest Hemingway's very famous novel, uh, A Farewell to Arms. I know we've talked about him before. We took a look at some of his simple sentences a while ago. But let's have a look at this. And um, while I read it, you can study it. And then we'll take a look at a very different kind of voice that demonstrates different uh, kinds of distance, tone, and attitude. And that is the very famous novelist J.D. Salinger, uh, one of the most reclusive nuts in American literature. Didn't answer his phone for 40 years. It's likely in high school that you read his novel, The Catcher in the Rye. So I've got a little bit of reading to do to you here, and then I'm going to make some editorial comments on each specimen, on each artifact of prose, and then I'll uh, conclude this lesson by um, making some comments uh, about the critical review, uh, and hopefully I'll find you. I'll hint or two to help you be successful in that paper. Take a look at this. Chapter 1. It's almost 90 years old. In the late summer of that year, we lived in a house in a village that looked across the river and the plain to the mountains. In the bed of the river, there were pebbles and boulders, dry and white in the sun, and the water was clear and swiftly moving and blue in the channels. Troops went by the house and down the road, and the dust they raised powdered the leaves of the trees. The trunks of the trees, too, were dusty, and the leaves fell early that year, and we saw the troops marching along the road, and the dust rising, and leaves stirred by the breeze falling, and the soldiers marching, and afterward the road bare and white, except for the leaves. I love this first paragraph so much, it's kind of hard to talk about. I haven't been secretive about the fact that I adore Ernest Hemingway. I really admire him, um, and uh, I really admire this first uh, paragraph of his very famous novel, Farewell to Arms. He deserved the Nobel Prize for Literature uh, when he earned it back in, I think, 1954. The tone and the attitude here is pretty neutral. This is the voice of a journalist. He is simply reporting what he's seen uh, in this World War I novel. It's hard to tell what his tone and attitude is. We couldn't necessarily call it positive. We necessarily you know, couldn't really call it uh, negative. He is just projecting the images and um, beginning this novel with the, the big images um, that he sees. Uh, I, I would say that the tone is neutral. I would say that the attitude is neutral. I would also say that the distance here between the voice Hemingway and us as readers is far. Uh, this speaker here is actually talking in first person, Fred McHenry, but he doesn't seem to be aware that he's telling us a story. Uh, I don't feel close to this uh, writer, maybe you do, but I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't have that sense. Uh, he's sort of holding us uh, at bay. Now let's take a look at a, a very different page, uh, also from a, a great American novel. And this is the voice of a young man named Holden Caulfield, who is the first person narrator of the famous novel, Catcher in the Rye. Well, I won't read the whole paragraph to you, because we want to keep moving here, but check out this voice. I think stylistically, in terms of tone, distance, and attitude, you're going to see something really different. Chapter 1. If you really want to hear about it, the first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born, and what my lousy childhood was like, and how my parents were occupied, and all before they had me, and all that David Copperfield kind of crap. But I don't feel like going into it, if you want to know the truth. In the first place, that stuff bores me. And in the second place, my friends would have had about two hemorrhages apiece if I told anything pretty personal about them. They're quite touchy about anything like that, especially my father. They're nice and all, I'm not saying that, but they're also touchy as hell. We would all agree here, I know you could recognize this, the examples are pretty obvious. This is a very different voice. We can definitely feel his tone and attitude. We've got some cynicism here. He's pushing back against the reader on the first page. Um, I, I don't think I would call that positive at all. Uh, it, it, it's sort of uh, sort of reckless, and it is, it's the voice of a boy. Let me tell you one other secret about this book. I might, I might seem pretty neurotic as I reveal this, but uh, in the novel that you just read, and that you just wrote about, I'm getting going on those papers, don't worry. In The Great Gatsby, 
If you open up the first page, like I did years ago, if you count the first and second person pronouns on the first page of The Great Gatsby, you get 14 I's, uh, or U's. Now, in this novel, and I'm not sure if it's this edition or not, but I picked up an edition of The Great uh, the Catcher in the Rye years ago, and I just sort of sat and physically counted how many I's and U's and me's, how many first and second person pronouns there are on page one. There's 28, twice as many. So when you read The Great Gatsby, we don't feel close to the narrator, Nick Carroll. We feel far from him. We feel distant. And that is a very deliberate technique of F. Scott Fitzgerald. Salinger, of course, here uh, is taking and creating an implied voice like we talked about earlier. And he is really pulling us close. I mean, he really wants to be our friend and confide and confess and tell us all these stories. But the use of those pronouns, the use of the uh, common vernacular language, it really makes us feel closer to the writer. And I, I think I invite you to recognize these as concepts in all writing, not just the books and magazines that you might pick up, but in the things that you write and, and, and in your writing. Um, I love these books and I love, uh, I love thinking in this way. So now we've talked a little bit about uh, tone and, and distance and attitude and at least put the concepts before you. And uh, let's just talk briefly about uh, the, the critical review. Um, I was telling my face-to-face -face students, and I was also telling my Johnnies and Bennies this, because I'm having them do the same assignment. I'm having all of my uh, writers, 